Good morning. Zephaniah, judging by the rustling of the pages, maybe we should have given a little extra moment, Frank, to find where it was at. Um, My name is Travis. I'm a pastor here at Grace Covenant Church, and I have the joy, the privilege, the delight to open God's word to you and to proclaim his good news to you this morning. Will you pray with me? Father God, I just want to take a moment to, to rest, for you to quiet our hearts, to be able to hear what you have to say through your prophet Zephaniah. God, I pray that you would start to perk up our ears to be able to see this amazing truth, God, that you sing over your church. God, I pray that the, the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight. God, that as I proclaim the words that you've given me, that you would continue to purify your bride, that you would call out more to be a part of your church, and that ultimately, God, that you would be glorified and magnified in this morning. Let us start out 2020 magnifying the name of our Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You might be surprised by my favorite memory from Super Bowl 48. For those of you who can't remember, it was the least competitive Super Bowl in the past 20 years. In 2014, the Seahawks crushed the Broncos 43-8. to Yeah, Seahawks fan. <laughs> It was a stinker of a game, unless you're a Seahawks fan, of course. And now I love football, but that might be the only Super Bowl that I think I remember more about the halftime show than I remember about the entire game. Bruno Mars was the headliner. (laughs) And I I didn't know much about this guy, Bruno Mars, about him or his music, or so I thought. You see, Lindy and I had just gotten married a couple months before, And now we were watching this game together with some church friends. And Bruno's show, it was really impressive. Not like the uh, meh performances of Beyonce or Madonna. I know, I just made a lot of enemies saying that. (laughs) But it wasn't that great. And especially the Black Eyed Peas the year before that. It was pretty bad. But all of a sudden, the music for the song, Just the Way You Are, came on. Which, if you recall, is a love song. And I had no idea that this was his song. I, I, I don't know why. I mean, in the age of technology and your, your internet on your phone, for some reason, who wrote that song had eluded me, and I just knew the song, but I didn't know the artist. And I knew the lyrics, though, because I had been singing that song over and over and over again in my car as I was engaged to my bride, as I was thinking about Lindy. And so when that music turned on, you know what I did? I serenaded her in front of all of our friends. (laughs) And she blushed, of course, right? But I didn't stop singing until the song was done because I was singing over my bride. I was singing over my bride. Sorry. (laughs) And I know I'm not the only husband that's done that. That's sung over his bride. But did you know that God sings over his bride? And today, this biblical idea brings us to this little obscure book of Zephaniah, the one that you're struggling to find. (laughs) It's just four books back from the New Testament. We go Matthew, Malachi, Zechariah, Haggai, and then Zephaniah in the Old Testament. This book is part of what's called the Minor Prophets, a collection of prophecies, not as lengthy as the book of Isaiah or Ezekiel or Jeremiah or, or Daniel, but nonetheless, the words in this book are rich with imagery, imagery about really tough things like God's judgment, imagery about God's covenant love, and then a hope that he puts before his people for their future. But before we dive into our passage this morning, because I'm, if you notice, I'm jumping to the very end of it. 
we need to provide some context so that we understand what's really going on here. We don't want to miss out what God's doing at the end of chapter 3. So let's dive in. Zephaniah 1, 1 says this, The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. Now Zephaniah's name means Yahweh is hidden or protected. And this is probably speaking to the, the, uh, the piety of his parents. Parents that were uh, pious and, and following the Lord would give names that attribute something to the Lord. They faithfully taught him God's law despite the rebellious culture around them at that time. And Zephaniah likely grew up during the time of King Manasseh, as you, who you might recall was a, a very wicked king, a super wicked king, a king that actually sought to turn back all of the, uh, the reforms that his father Hezekiah had put in place that were initially done to, to push the nation back toward God. But Zephaniah's prophecy, we see here, actually reigns out during Josiah's reign. And Josiah was that king who began to reign when he was eight years old. <laughs> Did you imagine starting to reign at eight years old? Be a king? We have enough difficulties adulting at 21 and above, right? He's being a king. And shortly after, he called for renewal among God's people. And a number of Israelites, they actually responded but many of them continue to neglect God's call of repentance upon them. The call of repentance to stop practicing injustice and worshiping other gods in, on one moment and then in the other moment trying to act like they're worshiping the God of the universe. But thus God saw fit to use Zephaniah to proclaim his prophecy once again to those who refused to initially respond. And his oracle of judgment begins in verse 2. Let's read. <laughs> I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal and the name of the idolatrous priests along with the priests, those who bow down on the roofs to the hosts of the heavens. Those who bow down and swear to the Lord and yet swear to Milcom. Those who have turned back from following the Lord. Who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. Be silent before the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. What a shock these words would have been to the people of Judah. See, by this time the nation had been divided up into two kingdoms. Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And not only that, the one in the north didn't exist anymore because the Assyrians had come in and defeated them and then brought them into exile. And despite the recent history of what they saw in the north, Judah had grown complacent and they were comfortable thinking the same thing could never happen to them. Why? Because Jerusalem was where they lived. The holy city of Jerusalem was their capital. The temple was there. God couldn't let this, this sacred place be destroyed, right? Plus, look, look at the, the, the nation's ruler. It's Josiah. Look how godly he is. And they held onto this physical habitation of Mount Zion as security from any earthly threat rather than clinging to the God who had saved them out of Egypt, the God who had even created the kingdom in the first place and the God who had preserved them over the generations. But God pronounced his coming judgment upon Jerusalem and Judah for their ongoing lack of devotion. And this expectation of, of punishment is, is found in verse 7 with the words that say, for the day of the Lord is near. You know, in the Bible, the day of the Lord often had immediate and future implications. It could refer to the final judgment that we see at the end of history, like in, in Revelation and elsewhere in the Bible. But when, when Zephaniah originally spoke, what was closer in view regarding this day of judgment was the, the near future destruction that was coming through the Babylonians. There's this captivity that was impending upon them. And Zephaniah 1, 12 through 14 continues in that same sort of idea and says this, at that time I will search Jerusalem with lamps and I will punish the men who are complacent. Those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good nor will he do ill. 
their goods shall be plundered and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. Though they, and the great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast, the sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. And after that, most of chapter 2 just continues the same really somber tone. And it clarifies that it's not just Jerusalem and Judah in case they're thinking, hey, that's not fair. Like, we're your people and you're, you're going to judge us, but what about the other ones? No, he says he's going to judge the other nations too. That's what, all what chapter 2 is talking about. He proclaims the Philistines, Moab, Ammon, Cush, and Assyria will get theirs as well. But God focuses his announcement towards those claiming to be God's people, but who act like there's no transcendent authority above them and to which they're accountable. Zephaniah 2.15 explains, This is the exultant city that lives securely, that said in her heart, I am and there is no one else. And Christian, if we are honest, we too easily can fall prey to the same functionally atheistic posture in the way that we think about and the way that we go about our daily lives. We often busy ourselves with distractions and entertainment or with the pursuit of good things, really good things, good things that God has given us, and they morph into these ultimate things that consume our affections, and they become little g-gods. But as one pastor has simply said, worshiping God and something else is not worshiping God. You can't have both of them. We can't have both the Lord as our God and other things as our God at the same time. And so the constant theme music of our day is to hustle and hurry and be busy all the time so that we can be justified before our little G gods. We want to be physically, financially, socially secure, good things. Yet contentment and rest just often elude us. They seem impossible to grasp a hold because when that's all we're thinking about is these little G gods, it drives us to exhaustion. They never seem to approve of us. And thus, for many of us, the pangs of anxiety, unfilled dreams, and the, the resulting self-loathing that just comes upon us and bitters us. It makes us even callous to those around us, even though we claim to know the God of this glorious grace. And as verse 14 says, the sound of the day of the Lord is bitterness, to the point where even the powerful, famous, and influential men and women of the world cry out, suffering tremendous loss. Now you might be thinking, man, this is a pretty negative sermon thus far. The text we read was a lot happier than I thought that this was going to go. I know, you're telling me I'm having to say it to you. But we can't neglect the context that comes before our passage today. Otherwise, we might misunderstand Zephaniah's whole message. Honestly, go back and read it for yourself this week, and you will see that the book basically starts out with no hope in sight. It's dreadful. Like, there's no hope in sight. But in the midst of this seemingly hopeless situation in which all of us perhaps have found ourselves at some point or even today, a glimmer of hope starts to shine through. Another sound besides the bitter noise of the day of the Lord starts to become audible in the distance. We see that in Zephaniah 2, 1, 3. He says, Gather together, yes, gather, who? O shameless nation. Before the decree takes effect, these, these judgments I'm throwing out there, before the day passes away like chaff, before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord, before the, there comes upon you the day of the anger of the Lord, seek the Lord, all you humble of the land who do his just commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility, and perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. There seems to be a, a remnant within this shameless nation of Israel who is given an out from the message of God's impending judgment. Perhaps there is some good news in the midst of all of this bad news that we see, that we have to wade through. In fact, by the end of the book, as we 
read earlier, God's anger somehow turns. <laughs> it somehow turns into this singing towards a particular people. How could man's cries from his sinful plight quite possibly be overcome by God's singing? And this is what I want to focus on for the rest of our time this morning. It is this glorious truth. If you don't remember anything else this morning, just grab a hold to this. If you are in Christ, the sovereign God of the universe sings over you. If you are in Christ, the sovereign God of the universe sings over you. And in the last verses of Zephaniah, we're going to see three characteristics of, of this song over his people. The first is his lyrics confront our sins to purify our souls. The second is his melody quiets our restless hearts, moving them to praise. And the third one is his great joy casts out fear so that we can serve him. The first one. Let's dive in. Number one, his lyrics confront our sins to purify our souls. His lyrics confront our sins to purify our souls. Let's take a look at Zephaniah 3 9. For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughters of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. On that day you shall not be put to shame. <clears throat> because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proudly exultant ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. But I will leave in your midst a people, humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies, nor shall they be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. God promises to purify the speech of his people. The speech is impure. It's unbecoming of those who would be called God's people, to be becoming of God's children. And a specific purpose lies behind this transformation of these profane lips. It's, it's so that they may call upon the name of the Lord. Why is the ability to cry out to the name of the Lord, to God's name, so important? Well, Joel 2.32 and and Romans repeats it again, and 10.13 says this, that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This call is absolutely necessary for, for salvation, and utterly impossible for those with unholy language, for out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And although it's hard to discern at a surface level, apart from God's purifying work on us, moving from the inside out, we all possess potty mouths. We do. Sure, we may not curse every other word in conversation, like we tend to think a potty mouth is, but without God's work upon us, we may regularly go honor God with our lips, all the while our heart is far from Him. And this is a shameful condition to have towards Almighty God. And yet Zephaniah proclaims, this remnant of His people on that day of judgment, you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. As we've looked in the first couple chapters, our rebellion is real and undeniable, but mercy here in this passage seems to be in order. The very fact that the people of Judah are being confronted again through Zephaniah's prophecy and not immediately destroyed, we have to see this as God's grace. Don't you realize all of the prophecies all of the announcements of judgment to people, that is an evidence of God's grace. He has every right to just destroy right away. But for some reason, he puts it out there so that some may respond and say, no, 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 I don't want, I want to turn back to you, God. He shows them grace, giving them one more chance to respond. Heeding this last chance warning results in one's shame, giving way to conviction and then conviction turning into real repentance. A turning back and reorienting one's life, entire self to God. But those who refuse to do so their entire lives, we see here in this text, will be removed from the midst of God's people when the end comes. 
And it, and it doesn't matter if you were to just darken the, the church doors every single day, every single Sunday, if you haven't repented of your sins, you won't be among God's people at the end of that day. The proudly unrepentant ones will no longer be among Israel, and what remains of her pride will be eradicated by God's power. Do you realize that God is presently doing the same work, the same work that he was doing with Israel now in his church today? He's purposely rooting out all of our infirmities to make us a humble and lowly people. But what I'm trying to say is, to, to put it, keep him with the, the metaphor of song, is that the lyrics of God's song can often be offensive to our depraved ears. And when I say offensive, some of you might immediately have that little like black and white square at the bottom of a CD that says parental advisory, explicit content. That's not what I'm talking about, okay? Like, I'm not referring to that. God's words and his standards are often difficult to hear, not because they are crude or misguided like those parental advisory CDs, but because of our impurity, because of our unholiness. Everything he says is perfect, true, right, and holy. Everything. But all too frequently, our culture and many of us will get up in arms against biblical ideas and claim that what is being proclaimed is actually, that's really offensive. And we feel attacked and we're beside ourselves. Now, caveat here, I know, I know that both inside and outside of the church, people can say really evil and wicked things for no good reason. They can just be downright rude. Sticks and stones break bones, but honestly, words really do hurt. They're painful. They can stick with you for years, for decades. That old saying is just not true. And that's not what I'm speaking about here. I'm, I'm speaking about this idea I believe in many folks today prefer to just make a beeline to labeling something offensive because they simply disagree with it. The words are violence to them. But what if the thing that is being confronted and making us feel offended is actually opposed to God and his kingdom? What if it's opposed to him? It's not a result of God's spirit-bearing fruit in our lives. It's not something virtuous. It's not something good that's kind of coming out of us. Perhaps the one you claim that's like come to you and offended you, maybe they were even motivated by courage and love. They're not just trying to cause drama and, and bring up an issue. and they, they care for you as a person. Proverbs 27, 6 reminds us, faithful are the wounds of a friend and profuse are the kisses of an enemy. The Lord God is the best friend, guys, that you could ever have. Many moments when we perceive offense are because we have already decided to set up our defenses. We've, we set them up and we're going to coddle and justify something within us that is truly wicked. And rather than giving us a usual pass on it like maybe we ourselves do or, or some family or friends or the culture for sure, God confronts it and says this is not right. And it's in those instances that our sovereign God is doing the most loving most virtuous thing he can do by taking shots at our attitudes and our actions that oppose him. The ones that we wrongly perceive that are virtuous or at bare minimum, oh, it's just normal. And in his divine love, our father roots out our misguided affections and calls us to something greater, something better, a life of flourishing and joy rather than bitterness, resentment, and finger pointing. For the, there's no plank in God's eye when he confronts all the sawdust in ours. God is committed to purifying his church and conforming her to the image of Christ, his son. He will do it. And the result will be a people who, as in verse 13 says, do no injustice and speak no lies, nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. The very name that the Spirit enables us to first cry out for salvation, to call upon, becomes the very name in which we find eternal refuge. Christians seek their refuge in the name of the Lord. And no other name is secure in earth or heaven, which brings me to my next point. 
Number two, his melody quiets our restless hearts, moving them to praise. His melody quiets our restless hearts, moving them to praise. The latter half of verse 13 reads this way. For they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. They shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Zephaniah seamlessly shifts to this metaphor of God as a shepherd and his people as a sheep. And on the day of the Lord, we see here that the flock of God has no need to fear anymore. For all the goats and and the, the wolves are removed from their midst. God's people are able to graze. They're able to lie down in his pasture. You know, it's, it's hard to lie down, right? If you're scared something's going to happen around you. I mean, imagine some of our brothers that have served in the armed forces and been in hostile territories. You, it's hard to go to sleep. You have an eye open to make sure that nothing comes upon you too quickly. Or at least maybe you can sleep while there's a watchman that's standing guard that's making sure that's going to be able to alert you if something comes upon you quickly. And that is what we observe in this text. We see the the good shepherd is among his flock, living with them, watching over them day and night. And on the day of judgment, this interesting thing happens. The perfect judge also plays the part of a shepherd. And thus the vision of Psalm 23 comes into view. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And the church no longer stumbles around chasing the siren songs of the culture that says that they must want these certain things and they no longer seek the validation from the world around them. Because what more can a Christian want? What more do we need? We have God himself. God makes us his sheep to lie down in green pastures and he leads us beside still waters. He restores our soul and he leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And the valley of death, that can't ultimately overcome us, right? Because we don't have any fear because the king of Israel is in our midst, comforting us with his rod and his staff. We have all that we could ever want or need with the sovereign God as our refuge. Whom have I in heaven but you and there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. As Augustine once wrote in his confessions, it says, because you have made us for yourself, our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. Do you guys feel that? Restlessness? And in those moments when you draw near to God, like it starts to dissipate? God's melody, it, it quiets and it slows us down. It quiets our restless hearts. It makes us hear his, his love for us. As Zephaniah says later, he will quiet you by his love. How does, how does that quiet rest sound to you right now? Sound to you after Christmas breaks over and you have to go back and work. New Year's is done and 2020 holds like all this anticipation but at the same time kind of this like oh is it gonna is it gonna go well is this year gonna be better and oh gosh I don't even talk about the election like you know like any of that stuff how does that quiet rest sound to you does it seem impossible I imagine your days like mine are marked by a, a struggle to consistently experience true and abiding rest Perhaps you're a a mother who grieves from being more estranged from her daughter than ever before. Perhaps you're a a parent who worries about your child's delay developmentally. Perhaps you have experienced a job loss and now there's this significant strain on you financially. Or maybe you didn't lose a job but someone else lost a job beside you and now the weight of all of their workload is now pressing on you in a way that you weren't expecting. Perhaps the medical diagnosis blindsides you and all of a sudden there's a ton of extra demands on your diet and your daily routine that you could have never expected. And I haven't really even mentioned anything in the news. And with each hardship and uncertainty, the volume of fear and anxiety in our life has turned up another notch. 
Dear Christian, in the middle of all these loud and difficult situations, the God of all comfort is with you. He's beside you. He's here to comfort you in your affliction, in your uncertainties, in your anxiety, in your sadness. We see in the Gospels that Jesus, our Savior, He constantly draws near to the broken and desperate and gives them healing. He holds on to them. Those who are needy then also run to Him. And the same Good Shepherd is beside you today. He sees everything you're going through. His name, the one in Zephaniah that we just read about, that we find refuge, is Emmanuel as we celebrate it during Advent. God with us. He is with you. In 2 Corinthians 1, 5, Paul reminds us, for as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Rest in God's marvelous love. As hard as it might seem to do that, as hard as it might seem to do that and comprehend it, brother and sister, you have no reason to fear whatsoever. No reason to fear. And according to Zephaniah, instead of fearing the evil around you or even inside you, the very presence of the Sovereign One commands you to do something really, really absurd. He says, sing. He says, sing. Verse 14 says, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Do you guys see this? This, is, this singing is not a half-hearted moving of the lips that produces little to no sound. Like, I'm sure most of you watched Elf during Christmas at the end where Walter Hobbs isn't singing. You're not singing. You know, what's the big deal? He's not singing, right? He's not opening his lips. This is, this is actual sound coming out of your mouth. The prophet says, sing aloud. He says, shout, rejoice, and exult with part of your heart, just a little bit of your heart, just your heart on Sunday. No, all of your heart, every bit of your heart. And this weird sort of thing, God quiets the restless hearts of his sheep and then moves them to exuberant praise of his name. And we can sing at the top of our lungs in every possible way. We get to praise him together corporately as a church when we gather together on Sunday mornings. You can worship him in the car. You can turn up the radio high. That's one of my favorite places to do it. You can turn it on while you're you're watching over your, your beautiful children, stay-at-home mom. You can turn it on while you're working around the house, dad and father. You can even sing with, with tears in your eyes. Well, you might say, I'm not much of a singer. I mean, you haven't stood in front of me during the service, have you? You know? <laughs> I can't tear, carry a tune. Okay, well, regarding that little complaint, a rebuttal to this command of singing, I ask this question, does, does a loving father delight in the song of his child? I don't know how many of you have listened to kids sing. It is, it is a cacophony of, of beauty. Like, <laughs> it is both awful and amazing. <laughs> as a father enjoys the songs of his child despite their imperfect key and rhythm, so our God rejoices over the melodious notes of his sons and daughters. His compassion just completely ignores our pitiful musical performance, and he hears the heart behind our efforts. How very kind of that father of ours. Well, perhaps you might say, I, I don't like that we must sing at church each week. Like, I like the preaching, I like all the other things. Uh, why does that have to be a part of what we do as a church, is singing? And my response would be, that's, that's a really odd thing to say. And Maybe I just came up with that question on my own, but maybe someone's asking it. The command of God's church to sing and shout shouldn't be burdensome for those of us who have truly believed in the gospel. Believers live in this place of refuge and rest and no fear. And they get, to, they get to sing in response to that. Why do we sing? Well, Zephaniah 3.15 answers. 
It says, the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst, and you shall never again fear evil. That's why you can sing. That's why you can sing. There is no judgment upon you, Christian. He's justified you by the gracious work of Christ on the cross. The judgments that you and I deserve have been placed upon the Son of God, and we have now been hidden in Him. Remember earlier when the idea of like, perhaps we can seek the Lord and maybe we can be hidden in the day of anger. The reality is, is Jesus Christ provides that place that we can be hidden from the judgments that occupy all of the first three chapters of Zephaniah. He brings us to repentance. We seek him. We seek his righteousness. And we, like Israel's remnant, are able to sing aloud. Man, in Zephaniah, I mean, the whole time I'm reading this, I'm seeing these connections between all these glorious doctrines of God's salvation that we usually think or, 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 you know, reside only in the New Testament. No, like they're all throughout the Old Testament. I mean, justification, being declared righteous before God's sight. Sanctification, we always talked about the purification of our speech, right? Glorification, this idea of like a spotless bride being brought to his to her husband, the Lord. Reconciliation, the, the daughter of the dispersed ones out and about, they're, they're being brought in and gathered in to be with God. And then the ones that are most present here, we see the, the idea of propitiation. God's wrath is satisfied. It doesn't fall upon you and me. And instead, righteousness is imputed upon you. That's the whole reason why you can sing. And you are in union with Christ as you believe on the gospel. Colossians 3.3 3 states, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And likewise, as that glorious verse in Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. What God thinks about us has to be more important than what the rest of the world thinks about us. And yet the Lord tells us, he has taken away our judgments against us in Christ. And likewise, we have victory over all of our enemies and are secure in Christ and have nothing to fear whatsoever. Which brings me to my final point. Three, his great joy casts out our fears so we can serve him. His great joy casts out our fears so that we can serve him. God enables us to sing just as he commands. But not only that, he models for us how to do it. He doesn't tell us to do something that he doesn't do himself. Look at verse 16. On that day it shall be said in Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. And I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. This is amazing, guys. This is amazing. He doesn't just remove you from your judgments. He doesn't take those away from you. He, he brings you into his joy. As Pastor Mike Bullmore says, God has provided salvation not just as an escape from God's judgment, but as an entrance into God's very joy. The putting away of judgment is just the pathway into God's joy. And what we see here at the end of Zephaniah, at the conclusion of these three chapters focused on the legitimate anger and judgment that we deserve from God, is this joyful anthem of God singing over his redeemed singing over them, and he rejoices over his church, not, not because there's anything inherently lovely within you or within me. There's nothing. We've been unified and brought in union with Christ, and so he sings over his son who we've been unified with. If you are in Christ, the sovereign God of the universe sings over you. The Father delights in you just like he delights in his son. And we have become one with him who was on that cross. He took on that flesh. He dwelt among us. He is the mighty one who saves. 
There is no one else. He is the mighty one who saves us from our rebellion and our shame. And thus the ballad of God's happiness becomes our soundtrack as we walk through life with even, there's still some clouds overhead if we're honest. In verse 18, it says the festival, or or literally in the Hebrew, it says the appointed time. That indicated the coming of the Babylonians. At this time, there was still that anxiety of of that judgment coming. And the true Israelites, they mourned. They mourned the corporate sin of their nation, the impending defeat at the hands of this ruthless people because of the, the collective disobedience of this people. However, they were given this hope of being gathered together again as God's people without reproach. And you see a little foretaste of that in in the events that unfold in Ezra and Nehemiah, and they come back from captivity. But it's still, it it just wets your whistle of what's to come, of what's really going to happen when God's people are brought out of exile and brought home to to their God. Because if we're true to ourselves, we... We know that we live in the already but not yet reality of God's kingdom. We know, we know, we sing it, that sin and evil have been defeated on the cross. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. We, we know that he has completely done away with it on Calvary. But then at the same time, it's not completely eradicated. And we know that at the second coming, he's going to do away with all of it. When he comes again, he's going to completely wipe it away. As Matthew Henry comments, the noises of war shall be silenced, the reproach of famine done away, and the captivity brought back. For us, though some grievances remain, they shall be only afflictions. They're not judgments. For sin shall be pardoned. Our sins pardoned. All the things we have are light and momentary afflictions that are building up for us an eternal weight of glory. I recently heard the question, what would you do if you had no fear? The point we're making here is his great joy casts out our fear so we can serve him. What would you do if you had no fear? Zephaniah 3.16 says, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. Fear, it makes our hands grow weak, slack. It makes it harder to do things. It works against our motivation to, to push on, and especially those things for the Lord that we've been called to. But our God has come to cast out all fear, and he does so even with the song. As John Calvin once said, God does not free us from all trouble and fear that we may grow torpid in our pleasures, but that we may, on the contrary, be more attentive to our duty. Now, torpid, that's a weird word. It just means mentally or physically inactive, lethargic. God's version of the good life for you is not leisure and lethargy, but it is one of rest and service. He does not save us so that we would become idle and complacent, much like the, those in Judah did in the time of this prophecy. No, no, no. But from this place of fearless rest in Christ, he calls you and me to serve diligently in his kingdom. If you had nothing to fear, what would you do for God? Or let me put it a different way. Dear Christian, how would you serve God if you knew he was singing over you? How would you serve God if you knew that your judgment was cast away in Christ and he was singing over you? Husband, father, would you finally begin to lead your wife in prayer and in reading the word? Would you, dear friend, share the gospel again with that parent or that sibling who's so hostile against the faith that you hold so dear? Would you set aside some time or some money to be hospitable and build a relationship with those people that live beside you that are called neighbors (laughs) that you've lived beside for years and just kind of resolve to just not talk to them? Would you intentionally carve out time in each of your months to serve in the church, to serve at Threads of Hope, to serve down at the Cat House, to serve 
not even a way that you had to be approved by us, but like you go out of your way to just serve someone in need. Would you strategically leverage your, your own job to proclaim the gospel to those that are in your midst, perhaps even the nations that have been brought to you and your company's hired? Or could you perhaps say, I'm going to take this job that I have and I'm going to then use it and go to the nations? Or maybe I'm going to leave my job and go to the nations and proclaim the good news of the gospel. Perhaps maybe you'll begin the process to foster or adopt a child in need. An image-bearing child in need. And you could be the proclamation of a good, good father that you know who loves you dearly to that child. What would you do if you had no fear? What would you do? How would you serve God if you knew he was singing over you? If you could push aside the business and you can hear him singing over you, his beloved child. And I know, I know some of these possibilities I just listed off, like they require tremendous sacrifice from us. You would need to, to give up significant time and money and comfort, perhaps even a spare bedroom in your homes to make it happen. And many of you might be thinking, there's no way I can add something like that onto my life right now. And that might be true. Like perhaps you aren't ready. Perhaps you're not mature enough to, to step into some of those things. And you don't have the margin or place to to do those things well the follow-up question to that dilemma is what do you need to say no to maybe your resolution is to say no to certain things to say no to even good things for better things saying yes to things that can only actually be accomplished if the holy spirit enlivens and moves them forward not something that requires some grit and going to the gym. That's good. You need to, your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Make sure it's taken care of. But like things that aren't just contingent upon your grit and your grinding and your getting down and working harder, but things that you set the sails and the Holy Spirit moves your ship through. What would you do? You need to ask yourself these questions. And it may be a little painful to wrestle over these questions with God, maybe with your, with your wife and even your children. Bring them into the discussion. But it's good for your soul. It's good for the church. And it's definitely good for your neighbors around you. The reality is, is our fear of anything in this life is feather light compared to the unfathomable weight of God's wrath that we formerly deserved. And for those of you here this morning who have not believed the gospel of Christ, Man, I urge you today, run to the only available refuge to you, the name of the Lord Jesus. Call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. The, the sobering truth is that all of the things that we just focused on, from verses 9 to 20, if you don't believe on the gospel, they're not for you yet. Everything else, the really sobering stuff that we had to wade through to get to the end of the book, that's what's presently upon you. It's God's wrath and his judgment. But Jesus calls you and says, believe on me, believe the gospel, repent and be saved. And when you do that, you can do it this morning. Instead of hearing those awful judgment words of the first three chapters instead you hear this the lord has taken away the judgments against you and you shall never fear again and god's removal of judgment found in believing the gospel of christ will give way in you just like it's given way to all of us here give way in you to a chorus made up of your voice and god's voice so if you're in christ the sovereign God sings over you. The sovereign God of the universe who created the stars, who created everything, who sustains all things, he sings over you. And as we have seen this morning, God graciously 
as he's singing over us, he confronts our sins and purifies our souls to make us into that spotless bride that he will receive at the end of the age. He quiets our restless hearts so that we're prepared to praise his name. And his joy is it's so loud that it drowns out and casts out all the fears that we could ever have. How remarkable is this perfect and mighty and beautiful and loving God who created everything and he even likes to sing. And not just sing, he sings loudly over his bride. You pray with me. Father God, thank you for the good news of the fact that you sing over us who are in Christ. reality is, is we all deserve judgment. We all have been shameful. We've sought other gods, sought satisfaction in things that aren't you. We've rebelled. And yet in the midst of all of that sin, all the things that we have done in running away from you, you sent your son who came into our midst and took on the judgment that we deserve. Father God, thank you for Jesus. And thank you that now because of him, we've been brought in union with him, you now sing over your bride. And as a result, we get to sing too, and I pray that we would do that now um, together as a church body. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews 10 reminds us that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but rather we're to meet together in order to encourage each other to love and to good works. We're glad to be able to provide these videos as a means of proclaiming the gospel and encouraging Christians in their walk. However, I want to remind you, this is just a supplement to your Christian life and not meant to replace the local church. So I encourage you, find a Christ-centered Bible preaching church and join yourself to it.